Asato ma sadgamaya, tamaso ma jyotir gamaya, mrityur ma amritam gamaya, om shanti shanti shanti. Om, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness unto light, lead us from death to immortality, om. Peace, peace, peace. Good morning and namaste to everybody. The few who are brave souls who are gathered here and our much larger virtual audience. The subject today is Vedanta through five parables. Often I have seen that uh, the and then all the teachings of Vedanta, it is the stories which people remember, the stories which people like. We know that uh, Jesus taught through parables. Sri Ramakrishna taught through some very interesting parables. Great spiritual masters have often conveyed um, the spiritual truths through interesting stories. And they know our psychology, that we may not remember abstruse metaphysical truths, but everybody loves a nice story. Over the years, uh, I've heard wonderful stories illustrating the most profound teachings of Vedanta. And uh, I have told these stories a number of times. Uh, in fact, what I'm going to say today, the five stories which I've collected, which sort of express the essence of Vedanta, the whole spiritual journey and the, and the deepest truths. Uh, I have told these stories uh, time and again, and uh, uh, I remember once, several years ago, at Oxford University, I was uh, speaking with a, with a professor of, of uh, Chinese studies, whom I know, and I was, was just talking about the Vedanta talks, you're saying your talks are very, very popular. I said, yes, but that's a problem, because in this day and age, it's all online. So everybody has heard everything. And it's very difficult to come up with something new every time. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> I have to keep repeating myself. Uh, and that worries me. And the professor said, No, Swami, you don't have to come up with new things. People don't expect that from you. You know, when, they, when famous uh, um, rock stars and pop musicians, they go and perform, people want a play, the, their favorite songs to be played. The golden, the top hits, the golden oldies. So, today we're going to hear some of the golden oldies. <laughs> yeah. We have the five stories. Four I have heard from monks in the Himalayas, um, either directly from them or through books uh, or in the talks. And so I have no real textual source for those four stories, the first four stories. It's just word of mouth. Uh, it's, it's an oral tradition handed down from a teacher to, to a student. And the fifth one is well known. The last story will be from Swami Vivekananda, which is published. So five stories and the most profound truths of Advaita Vedanta. The first one, and there's a method. There's a method to my madness. <laughs> Why I'm telling these stories, there's a particular sequence to it, which we shall see. The first one deals with the... The methodology of Advaita Vedanta. What is going on here? This first story will show how Advaita teaches. In Advaita Vedanta, the journey is from ignorance to knowledge, from not knowing to realizing to knowing. And how it is done, there's a particular methodology. Once, the reason I've told this, I'm going to tell this particular story first is, all the other stories which will follow, they all have the same inner code. You will be able to identify what's going on there. So the first story is the key to unlocking the other four stories. In fact, it's the key to the entire Vedanta philosophy. The story, the story of an ass, a donkey. So this is the washerman's uh, donkey story. This, you have to imagine India. A washerman goes around, collects your... Uh, dirty laundry and, and takes it and he has a donkey on which he loads the laundry and then takes it to the uh, to the r r river river 
side and then uh, cleans it, washes it thoroughly, spreads it out on the rocks to dry the, your clothes. And then finally, he will fold them nicely. And next day, on the same donkey, he will go around, do the rounds and deliver the clean clothes back to you. Even now, they do, do it. All the modern laundries have come into vogue now. And people do have uh, machines to do their washing at home. But they're still the traditional washermen. Are there. At least I have seen them in my own childhood. So this washerman, he goes from his house with the load of uh, laundry to, to be cleaned to the river. He loads up the donkey and takes it along there. And when he reaches the, he reaches the river, to his dismay he finds, if he had forgotten to bring the rope with which to tie the donkey to the tree. Now this is a disaster for the poor man, because if he, if he has to go all the way back home, the day is wasted. And he can't leave the donkey untied, because if the donkey wanders off and that's it, uh, it's like the washerman's SUV, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, he'll be ruined. He's a poor man. And he's now wondering what to do. He can't leave the donkey untended. And a person, you know, a gentleman of the village walks past and says, oh, what's wrong? And the washerman says, oh, sir, I'm in so much trouble. This is the problem. I forgot to get the rope. How do I leave the donkey? I have to work hard near the river all day and I can't keep an eye on the donkey. The man said, this is no problem at all. Just pretend to tie the donkey. You know, go through the motions. That's all. Yes, just make sure the donkey sees you. So he does that. He pretends to take out the rope and tie it around the neck of the donkey and then tie it to the tree. And the donkey is watching him. And then the washerman <laughs> takes the load of clothes and tentatively goes back, goes to the river and looks back at the donkey. And the donkey is also looking back at it, but not moving, staying there near the tree. And the washerman washes the clothes and once in a while looks back in the distance and sees the donkey is there, it's just eating grass and just staying there near the tree as if it's tied. In the evening when he's all done, the clothes are washed and dried and folded. He brings them back and loads the donkey and says, hut, let's go back home. And the donkey doesn't move. Obviously the donkey think it, thinks it's tied. The washerman doesn't know what to do. I mean, if it was really tied, he could have untied it. But it's not really tied. What does he do? And he runs to the gentleman's house and says, Sir, what trouble you have put me in? Now the donkey won't move. The gentleman said, The solution is very simple. Just pretend to untie it. Just pretend. Yes, just pretend to untie it. Go through the motions. Make sure the donkey sees you. And then the washerman comes back and goes through the charade of untying this non-existent rope. The non-existent rope. And the donkey watches. And then the washerman says, hut, let's go. And the donkey moves. So this story illustrates the whole spiritual, uh, the, the philosophy, the philosophical methodology in Advaita Vedanta. In technical terms, this is called uh, Adhyaropa Pavada. Uh, Adhyaropa Pavada Abhyam Nishprapancham Prapanchati. This is the phrase. What does it mean? By the method of superimposition and desuperimposition, do the wise teach that which is transcendent, that which is beyond all you know, names and forms and language and conventions, which cannot be expressed, which cannot be even thought about. How do you express the inexpressible, the absolute you know, being, consciousness, bliss, which is beyond words? Even when you use the words being, consciousness, bliss, what exactly is it that you're referring to? How do you teach that? This is the method. We will see what the method is, but the core of it is superimposition and desuperimposition. Somehow the donkey which is free all the time comes to, be th comes to think that it is tied. Similarly, we the ever free consciousness, awareness, unlimited awareness, unlimited being, immortal, we come to feel that we are in samsara. We feel we are tied to these bodies. We are born with the birth of the body. We age with the aging of the body. We die with the death of the body. This seems to be us to, to us to be concrete truth. It's far from the truth. We are tied in samsara. And tied to people and bad relationships and um, financial problems and um, all sorts of uh, unhappinesses in this world. Our own internal desires and frustrations and fears. We feel we are tired. It's concrete truth. How can you say it's not true? And yet Vedanta has this radical 
devastating bombshell. It teaches us that you're not really bound. And yet, we feel we are. Then what's the way out? The only way out is what was done with the donkey. Is to de-hypnotize. To show that you're not really bound. And that's all that Vedanta does. This feeling that we are bound. I'm a body, I'm a mind. This is called superimposition. Adhyaropaha. And the whole technique of showing us that we are not bound. We never were. We are not and we will never be. It's impossible. That we are always the unlimited. We are never limited as bodies. Uh, this technique is called de-superimposition. Swami Vivekananda called it hypnotization and de-hypnotization. So this de-superimposition, uh, in um, Sanskrit this is called apavada, de-superimposition. That is the going to the motions to, sh to the so-called untying of the donkey. So this is the method. We will see. An assignment to all the here those who are hearing this these stories is that when we go through the, the remaining four stories, which will illustrate the central teachings of Vedanta, notice the superimposition and the desuperimposition. Always. In all Vedantic teaching, notice the superimposition, desuperimposition. All the stories which we will see now will have this superimposition, desuperimposition. Adhyaropa, apavada. The hypnotization and dehypnotization. Pointing to the Vedantic truth. First is, is arguably the, the um, one of the most popular stories. It has become very popular. Lots of people uh, they tell me, Swami, tell us that story. Is this true or is that true? Yes, such, yeah, was such. <laughs> so this story, I, I'll never forget the first time I heard it. It was uh, really quite a dramatic settings. I was in Gangotri in the Himalayas and this monk, um, after our uh, afternoon prasad, after, after getting bhiksha food, we would go for a walk in the mountains surrounding Gangotri, 10,000 feet high in the Himalayas, surrounded by forests, the Ganges, Ganga rushing by, a narrow fast stream, hundreds of feet below, and we'd walk the mount, narrow mountain paths until it came close to sunset, and then we would go back to our huts, caves, whatever. So one day, while walking with these monks, one of those monks, he was a really good storyteller. Only later I discovered that he would lengthen the stories or shorten them according to the sunset. You know, like It would go on and on until the sunset. <laughs> so one of the stories which was this story of the Emperor Janaka. The mighty Emperor Janaka. He goes to sleep one day in his palace and at night he suddenly awakened. Your Highness, wake up! Your Highness, wake up! What's wrong? The enemy has attacked. The enemy is upon us. There's an invasion. We must go and defend our kingdom, our empire. And the emperor says, uh, he jumps out of bed and he says, call out the army, call the generals, give me my armor, my, my bow and arrows, my sword and shield. And he goes out to fight the enemy at, in the dead of the night. And there's a terrible battle. And unfortunately, poor Janaka is defeated. He is captured by the enemy soldiers, put in chains and dragged before the invader. The invading king says that, Oh Janaka, you are of royal blood, so I will not kill you. But you are banished from your kingdom, your empire. It's now mine. I am the conqueror. You are to leave henceforth. And so Janaka, poor Janaka, what can he do? He's wounded and exhausted and devastated by his terrible loss. He walks and walks, begs for food somewhere, begs for water elsewhere, and nobody is willing to help him. He was the emperor yesterday, and today nobody wants to help him. They are scared of the new tyrant, the invader. And they say, you go, leave the kingdom as soon as possible. And poor Janaka, he walks to the border, and he crosses over to the next kingdom, which I always say leads me to think that his empire couldn't have been all that big. If within a few hours he could cross the border... <laughs> Uh, and then he goes there to the uh, other side of the border uh, and, and there he sees poor people. It's like a soup kitchen, you know, poor people are being fed. So um, in India they are called Annakshetras, food places. So there's a long queue line of people waiting for the rice and lentils preparation. Khichdi we call it in India. And Janaka stands there hopefully. When it's his turn he comes there 
and the man who is serving he says we are all out we just finished and janaka can't take it anymore he says whatever is there at the bottom of the cauldron of the bottle of the bottom of the of the barrel just give me that so whatever was there the last dregs those are scooped out and put in a bowl and given to this poor man who is obviously suffering and janaka with trembling hands brings the bowl to his lips and a kite was circling it swoops down and knocks the bowl from his hands and it goes all spilt in the dust the last of the food and poor janaka can't take it anymore he collapses on the on the uh ground there and and saying ha ha in i heard the story in hindi ha ha kar karte hue the monk said which the ha ha in hindi means exactly the opposite of what it means in english so in hindi or in indian languages ha ha means alas alas <laughs> not the english ha ha and he uh, falls on the, on the on the ground weeping and sits up on his bed his heart pounding and all sweaty and he looks around in the dark royal bed chamber he had obviously shouted and the uh, guard the sentry runs in and says your highness is anything wrong of course at that moment any one of us would have said oh that was a dream a nightmare thank god everything is fine but he's a philosopher janaka is a philosopher so he says uh, ye sach ya wo sach was that true or is this true the sentry is bewildered he doesn't know what to make of that he runs and calls the queen and the queen grumbling comes it's late in the night what's wrong with the old man now and uh, the emperor says in a confused in 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 a in a pondering tone yes such ya was such was that true or is this true the queen is also confused and worried she calls the doctor and the doctor takes his pulse and says sir is anything hurting what are you uncomfortable what's wrong is this true or was is that was that true and that's what he keeps on doing and next day in the morning you know no twitter in those days but the grape wine or the lotus wine <laughs> Uh, and the story is all around in the city and the marketplace that the emperor has lost his marbles he just keeps sits there saying was that true or is this true and the sage ashtavakra is visiting the the city and uh, he's friends with the emperor they have discussions on vedanta on and off so he hears that his friend the emperor has lost his marbles he's he's uh, he's gone crazy he keeps saying is this true or is that true so he decides to pay his friend the emperor a visit the sage goes to the court and the emperor is sitting there on his throne surrounded by his queen and ministers and generals and courtiers and everybody is bewildered they don't know what to do they go up to you can imagine the scene they go up to the emperor please sign the you know the bill to continue the government or something like that in the past <laughs> in the congress or something like that and the emperor says is this true or is that true was is this true or was that true so the the work of the empire is come to a standstill and uh, they don't know what to do so ashtavakra goes and says so emperor how are you today and the emperor says was that true or is this true and ashtavakra being this omniscient sage of course knows what the emperor is referring to so he says um that defeat that humiliation that terrible loss and the pain and the hunger and the exhaustion I mean you were rolling on the ground and and crying ha ha alas alas is all of that here now right now he's emperor as if coming out of a stupor he says no it's not here and all of this your might your um, um, generals and uh, your queen and your um, your army and all of this glory um, was all of this there at that time the emperor says no none of it was there so emperor neither this is true nor that is true now yes such now was such neither this is true nor that is true the emperor is stunned is this a nihilistic philosophy nothing is true and the emperor says so is nothing true everything is void everything is empty all is false and the sage says no emperor all of this it is not true it is an appearance and yet you are here you experience it do you not so yes and there 
that was a dream it's it's not true and the, that that defeat and the, the exhaustion and, and all that humiliation and the frustration and the pain no but you did experience it right you you saw it you were there you saw it you were there and you saw that emperor says yes you saw that and you saw this you are seeing this yes then emperor neither this is true nor that is true but you are the truth na yes such na wo such tum hi such now this is the story and this illustrates the core teaching of vedanta brahma satyam jagat mithya jeeva brahma hi vanapara brahman alone is true is the reality the world is an appearance and you the individual sentient being the one who considers himself or herself to be a samsari in trouble and sorrow you are that absolute reality how so so this is a teaching straight from the mandukya upanishad um where we are asked to consider our experiences our whole days are constituted of waking dreaming and deep sleep our waking days so i am the waker and i have i have experienced my waker's world the the people and the relationships and the jobs and the house and um my own body and all the issues that i have all the hopes that i have all of that i experience that is called the waker's world and i am the waker this person in this body but i fall asleep and in no time this entire waker's world is erased even my awareness of the body goes the body is sleeping my awareness now sees another world constituted by my mind i know that after waking up but it seems like a real world out there and i am there in that world i'm moving around doing things and enjoying and suffering that's a dream so i am the person in the dream the dreamer and the dreamer's world yeah. and then that also ceases i go into deep sleep no external world no body no mind and no subject no object all merged into one uniform blankness deep sleep that also comes and that also goes all of these come and go to one awareness oh, who is that you you are the one who sees the waking world you are the one who sees the dream dream world and you are the one who sees the darkness of the deep sleep you the awareness uh, as ashtavakra said to janak to to the emperor tum hi sach you are the truth but which you the one who sitting on the throne the one who is rolling in the dust neither this body nor that body can be the ultimate truth it came and went in your awareness neither this world of the empire and your glory nor that world of the defeat and disaster neither of them can be true they came and went but what is true the awareness which saw both both are movies but the one who saw the movies is true to you the consciousness is presented the waker and the waker's world in sanskrit in the uh, in the mandukya terms vishwa and jagrat prapancha to you the consciousness is presented the second the dreamer and the dreamer's world in sanskrit terms in in the upanishadic term terms the taijasa and the swapna prapancha dreamer and dreamer's world to you the awareness is presented the absence of deep sleep the blankness the absence not absence of sleep the absence which is experienced in deep sleep in um, upanishadic terms pragya and sushupti avastha sushupti prapancha now the prapancha literally means the the world in detail prapancha so in sushupti in deep sleep there is no world in detail it's a, just a merged blankness these are the three which come and go three sets three sets of what subject object right now there is a subject you and there is an object this objective universe in deep in dream dream also there is a subject you the dreamer and there is an object the dream world in deep sleep also there is a subject object but the subject object are merged into one so it's a blankness these three pairs subject object pairs they are presented to the awareness you yourself counting from the perspective of waker dreamer deep sleeper you the awareness can be can be called the fourth waker one dreamer two deep sleeper three 
you the awareness itself pure consciousness pure awareness pure awareness means not dressed up as the waker not dressed up as the dreamer not dressed up as a deep sleeper but you in yourself uh, that one that awareness can be called the fourth in sanskrit terms vishwa tejasa pragya and the fourth is called turiya the word turiya in sanskrit simply means four that's all it just means the number four this number four is actually not the fourth it is the one which appears as the three that consciousness you yourself it is the example which i love giving is of the gold and the ornaments it is the same gold which appears as the necklace if you melt it and make it into a bracelet the same gold same exact same material will appear as a bracelet melt it and make it into a ring the same gold will appear as a ring names are different necklace bracelet ring they look different necklace bracelet ring their uses are different Uh, necklace you put here the bracelet you put here the ring you put on your finger name form and use are different nama roopa vyavahara in sanskrit they're different and yet you know it's exactly the same material and that material gold alone is the reality not the name not the form not even the use you see how can you say that the name and form and use are not real they're not real in a very technical sense the technical sense is without the gold they don't stand what does it mean without the gold what will be left of the necklace nothing literally nothing the form will disappear take away the gold the form will disappear with the, no form at all can you use it can you put something around your neck no it will be like that emperor's new clothes story the emperor has no clothes then what does the name necklace refer to without the form without the ornament called necklace what does the word necklace refer to nothing it becomes a word without a referent this is called falsity all the time it is the same reality now notice the reality gold is not affected by the names and forms when it is a necklace it is same gold when it is a bracelet same gold when it is a ring same gold nothing has happened to it to gold qua gold as gold as gold nothing has happened to it is perfectly all right this consciousness alone appears as the gross universe the physical universe as this physical body through awareness through in mind and sense organs experiencing a physical world same awareness without any change at all now projects itself just as a mental universe called dream through the mind dressed up as the dream person the tejasa the same awareness now shuts down all projections and is there with the, with the left with the blankness of all projections which is deep sleep you are that awareness it is not affected by the goings on in the physical world the so called problems huh? or the nightmares or the problems of the uh, dream world or the blankness of the deep sleep they come and go they are mere entertainment to you the limitless awareness and the turiya the seventh mantra of the mandukya magnificent mantra which tells us the details of this but this is the story what have we learned that this story alone is real real in the sense the rest are like movies waking dreaming deep sleep like waking and dreaming are like two movies deep sleep is like switching up the movie story is constant then all of these movies and whatever is going on is within the turiya that within the sense that it's not apart from the turiya it's not like actually a movie hall where you're sitting there and there is actually a movie separate from you playing movie is not inside you your movie is outside you and you are watching the movie that's the sankhya philosophy the consciousness watching the play of prakriti but here in advaita notice just as in a dream the whole thing is in your mind similarly the whole waking dreaming and deep sleep are in turiya are an appearance in turiya they are not separate realities it is non dual a movie is actually not non dual actual movie if you go to a hall cinema hall and watch it's not non dual because you are the audience and there is the movie separately though it's a movie it's not real but still a separate thing apart from you here it's not like that it's all within turiya it's all an appearance in turiya not different from turiya this is the what is in vedanta called brahma satyam jagat mithya brahman alone is real the world is an appearance and who are you 
you are not really the waker you are not really the dreamer you are not really the deep sleeper you are turiya this is the meaning of the phrase jeeva brahmai vanapara the jeeva is none other than brahman you are the absolute and now you can happily play being the waker the dreamer and the deep sleeper knowing all the time that you are the abs- the, the actor can play at all kinds of roles on broadway none of the roles really touch or affect the actor the um, actor can play a beggar without his financial situation being ruined and equally the actor can play at being a billionaire without actually becoming a billionaire so none of the things that the actor plays in the broadway theater actually affects the actor neither financially nor physically health can play as dying person can play an athlete without becoming either uh, so you are that unaffected awareness the projection takes three forms gross subtle and causal gross or physical which is this world still a projection subtle is uh, the dream world all mental and the causal which is the deep sleep the seed form from which all of this comes if somebody asks now you are equating dream and waking the ashtavakra the sage said neither this is real nor that is real but dreams and waking are different in mandukya which is very advanced non dualism uh, dreams and waking are equated then the waking is no more real than the dream we protest immediately we say no 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 how can the waking be the same as the dream um they are different the waking is real and the dream is not real how so well we say um in the waking world things have things work so I, if i'm thirsty the water in the waking world will th- satisfy my thirst yeah. there is no such water in the dream world it's a fiction but that's not a valid comparison if you're thirsty in the dream which water will affect you you may have a bottle of water next to your bed when you're sleeping that bo- bottle of water is not available to you in the dream it's only the water in the dream which will quench your thirst in the dream it is only the water in the waking which will quench your thirst in the waking feeling hungry in the dream you uh, you left your uh, what is uh, pizza in in the fridge yeah left over in the dream you're feeling hungry that pizza will not help you you have to have food in the dream which will help you so uh, it is not that utility is a utility uh, uh, in the sanskrit they say artha kriya karitvam is it an argument for reality no you find utility in dream and uh, waking alike you cannot distinguish on the ground of utility another argument is no no waking is real and dream is false why because all the people and the things we see in the waking world are out there they're not in my mind and whatever i saw in the dream were in the mind inside what is imagined in the mind is not real what is actually there see there's a clock out here it's a real clock if i imagine a clock that's not a real clock so in the dream everything is imagined but in the waking world there are things outside my mind outside my body these are real things that's again not true the same difference between inner and outer is maintained in the dream in the dream don't you see people and things outside and don't you have imaginations inside so called inside and out and when you wake up the whole thing will have been imagined the distinction between inner and outer just externality so called externality is not a differentiator between waking and dream it's not enough to say that the waking is real and the dream is false in dream also things appear to be external and internal to you similar is another argument which comes forth is that um in the waking world things are real because they are publicly all of us see the same thing we don't see my dreams my dreams are private they are my imaginations but this waking world don't you share a public a, a common shared reality a public reality i am sitting on the chair and you see the same chair too you too can come and sit on it you see it you can use it so we share a reality in the waking so the waking world is real the dream worlds are private each of each person's dream is separate that seems to be convincing at first sight but that's also not true in one's own dream which is private no doubt but in that dream the distinction between private and public is also there if you go and meet your friend suppose you are having coffee with your friend 
um you have to sit outdoor and now it's snowing or something <laughs> you can't so if you have coffee with your friend in a cafe in in manhattan and uh, you know it may be snowing and people say that oh how can we have coffee here because it's snowing imagine there your friend does not say in your dream oh all the coffee and the snow is in your mind i can't see anything no in your dream you see the coffee and the snow falling and your friend the friend also sees it and when you wake up the whole thing was in your mind so in the public shared reality is also there in the dream just because it's a public shared reality does not mean that um, the dreams are less real than the waking no the same situation holds in dreams also so if you think in this way it's quite eerie it's it's creepy you know you begin to lose the blur the difference between it becomes like science fiction <laughs> yes so that is the uh, story of ye sach ya wo sach is this true or is that true you are that only truth is consciousness and the universe appears to consciousness to you the consciousness um notice the assignment which i gave you at the beginning the superimposition the superimposition adhyaropa pavada which part of it is the superimposition when the king janaka emperor janaka he thought that um uh, i have been defeated and uh, i have lost my empire and he was sad about it and he thought that this uh, um, that this is my uh, i'm i'm still in the court and surrounded by my uh, courtiers and ev- waking and dreaming and he was confused which is real is this real or is that real both of them are superimpositions both of them have tied so called tied the donkey and the superimposition when uh, ashtavakra comes and tells him neither that is real nor this is real you are the reality that is the superimposition apavada adhyaropa apavada by the method of superimposition the superimposition superimposition we have already done ourselves janaka had already done waking dreaming but because he was um, a philosopher he had viveka the discernment he had the question is this really true we go from we go from dream to dream and take it to be true first the dream janaka's dream that seemed to be true then he comes to waking that also seems to be true janaka questioned and thereupon came the answer neither of them is true that is the de superimposition untying the donkey all the time janaka was consciousness itself neither the defeated one rolling on the ground and crying ha ha kar nor the glorious one sitting on the throne surrounded by courtiers both are appearances both are movies playing on the one consciousness the turiya okay this consciousness which we are how to realize that how to break up break away from the body mind identification so that's the next the next story this is the uh even well mo- more well known story of the 10th man here the i mean this the 10th man story you find in many places actually there is a textual reference for example in the uh, panchadashi vidyaranya mentions the 10th man story and he makes a big deal out of it so the 10th man story is well known 10 friends were on a journey and they crossed a river and after having crossed the river they thought did we all cross safely or did anybody drown let's count one of them counted 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 oh my god 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 oh my god our 10th person has drowned our poor friend is dead the other said you're not counting right let me count and each one counted and they found only 9 people obviously they were not counting themselves and they sat down and started crying the 10th our friend the 10th man is dead as drowned along comes the wise person and says why are you crying my friends Oh we were ten on a journey and our tenth person the our friend is drown has drowned how do you know that we counted and we found only nine and this person must have counted them and found that there were ten people sitting and crying and he realized what had happened so he tells them don't cry my friends the tenth person is there where where don't cry relax believe me you see this is where the teaching comes from the uh, scriptures and the guru Tenth person is there. The reality is there. God is there. Atman is there. We don't know yet. It's still theoretical for us. We are just hearing this. 
So they are saying, yes, all right, we'll believe you. But where? We don't find him. I'll show you. Count. We counted. There were only nine. Humor me. Count again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And this wise man comes and turns the hand and says, Thou art the tenth. Ten. And the counter goes, Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten. Oh, I found the tenth person. That's wonderful. And the others say, Let me try, let me try. And they all try and they find the tenth person. And they're all happy. Now this story points to two things. One, the exact precise nature of enlightenment. And two, the entire spiritual journey. First of all, the crucial teaching about how to know ourselves as the witness consciousness. So take up any method of Vedantic inquiry, the method of the five sheets of the human personality, or even the waking, dreaming, deep sleep, which we talked about. Um, the five sheets, the physical body, the vital body, the mental body, the intellect, and the, the bliss body. And the Annamaya, Pranamaya, Manomaya, Vijnanamaya, and uh, the Anandamaya. Uh, are you this body? You start with what is most obvious. What is most external? What is everybody knows? Yes. Who are you? Where are you? Here. What is this? This is me. It is I. Yeah. What are you? This. Start with the body. And then we, were show, we are shown how we cannot be the body. Uh, we are not the... Uh, we are not the, um, you know, we, the baby's body and the child's body and the teenager's body, middle age and old age. I identify with each one. I say I'm the same one. The two are not alike. They're very different from each other. And yet I say I'm, I'm that one, that one and that one. Therefore I, the unchanging and the completely changing body, I cannot be the same. The changing and unchanging, they cannot be the same thing. I'm making a mistake here. Not only that, the body is something that I'm aware of. I am aware of the body. The body is not aware of me. Yeah. So I am consciousness, awareness. The body is non-conscious, insentient. Not only that, it's an object. I am the seer, the body is the seen. So because of these reasons, in Sanskrit, um, Savikara, Nirvikara, with change, without change. Um, drishya and Drashta, seer and the seen. Uh, Chetana and Jada, sentient and insentient. Because of these reasons, I cannot be the body. The body is here, but I am not the body. I am the unchanging, conscious seer. The body is ever-changing, not conscious, and it's the scene, the object. Then I, our attention is directed inwards. Let the body be like a sheath. The pranamaya, the breath, the life forces. The most obvious of which is the breath. Am I the breath? Am I life itself? And the same arguments can be applied. It is changing. It is an object. It is not conscious. You are unchanging. You are the subject and you are conscious. How can you be the breath? Then we, our attention is directed inwards, further inwards. Not the Anandamaya, not the Pranamaya, but the mind. Am I the mind? Most people identify with the mind. I'm the person, the, this person, this mind. Um, the thinker. The one who feels, uh, one who collects all perceptions, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, that mind. Am I that? Again, same thing. The mind is ever changing. Happy man, mind, sad, sad mind. I'm happy. I'm sad. I'm the same one who was happy and I'm the same one who's sad now. I'm the same one. The mind has changed so much. From childhood till now, the mind has changed so much. Imagine the thoughts we had when we were little kids. Imagine the feelings we had when we were little kids. The memories we had at one time. Very different from the thoughts, feelings and memories which we have now. Which mind am I? You say, no, no, Swami, you are confusing us. I, am, I was that mind and I am this one now. But the two are entirely different. How can you be the same and be entirely different at the same time? You know, the one <laughs> monk who was teaching said this in Hindi. I am both. I said, ah, wonderful. Gadabi or Ghodabi. And you are the donkey and the horse also. <laughs> the two are different. If the two are different, how can you be identical with and still remain the same? So it's logically impossible. Uh, so I'm not the mind. Am I the intellect which is doing all this inquiry? Same thing. Changing. Object. Non-sentient. Insentient. I am the unchanging. Subject. 
and conscious i am aware it is something i am aware of i cannot be the intellect not the vigyanamaya then the blankness beyond that which is experienced in deep sleep sushupti anandamaya not even that for the same reasons and here the upanishad keeps quiet from taittiriya upanishad this teaching is there we are supposed to see the atman the pure consciousness we are waiting it will be revealed to us grosser to subtler to subtler to causal and then the atman no the upanishad says nothing then i don't exist you see all that i thought i was now has been revealed to be not me it's there but it's not me then who am i then the upanishad asks you to turn inwards to the witness of the five the five sheets you see why did the counter one who was counting the nine people why did he not find the 10th one our answer will be because he did not count himself correct but why did he not count himself where was he expecting to find the 10th one he this case is very crucial he was expecting to find the 10th one out there why why was he so foolish because it's not foolish at all he's very reasonable he is operating on the principle where he found the other nine the 10th one should also be there where else will it be 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 the 10th one should be there not there because everything that he found was objective it's trained into thinking habituated into thinking that whatever exists must be an object but what about he himself the subject is one thing which is not an object similarly whatever we thought of ourselves as body and the vital forces and the mind and the intellect and even beyond the intellect the blankness they are all objects ask yourself to whom that is the turning at that point you have to do it intuitively yeah. we have done vedant has done as much as possible taken you to the very verge of that luminous gap between object and subject the next step must be yours you must intuitively grasp i am the awareness to which the five sheets appear i am the awareness to which waking dreaming and deep sleep appear i am that fourth to which the waker dreamer and deep sleepers appear and disappear so that turning inwards that's what the 10th man story shows then vidyaranya shows the entire spiritual journey in vedanta first step in seven stages through that that story seven stages of the spiritual journey in vedanta first step agyana ignorance they did not know that the 10th man was there they were not aware of the 10th man being there similarly we do not know of ourselves as the atman as being consciousness bliss as unlimited we don't know somehow we don't know we are born with this ignorance shankaracharya says in his brahma sutra bhashya introduction he says naisargiko ayam loka vyavahara naisargik means natural we are born with natural ignorance about our own nature he did not know that step step one next what happens not knowing the existence of the 10th man they fall into the error ignorance leads to error in sanskrit agyana to adhyasa what is the error is drowned is drowned the tenth man is drowned we are led into error what is the error not knowing that we are pure consciousness we are presented with a body and mind the error i am this body and mind its hunger is my hunger not that i am the awareness of the hunger which is the truth actually but i am hungry its pain is my pain not that i am aware of the pain it's i am in pain it hurts i am in hurt it starts naturally as babies so i identify with it directly you don't have to go to ignorance school to learn ignorance you have to go to knowledge school to learn knowledge this ignorance is shankaracharya says naturally it comes ignorance to error second stage is error agyana to adhyasa the what happens the man is dead is drowned not there therefore drowned third stage sorrow they sit down and cry ala ala our poor friend he drowned now we are lost we have lost our friend the 10th man this is called samsara 
not knowing our real nature we make the error third stage dukkha samsara i am um I, i am old i am sick i am poor i am dying nobody loves me um i am a failure i am alone in the world all false totally totally false this is samsara this is the third stage samsara fourth stage the guru comes and tells the tenth man is there that is tenth man is there he tells the truth the guru the upanishad comes vedanta comes and tells us that there is you are the atman tattvamasi you are the atman there is the atman which is existence consciousness bliss this is called paroksha gyana the indirect knowledge the stage at which we are told we don't know yet we read it we hear of it we admit that this could be a possibility but we don't see it that's the stage at which those those travelers said where is the 10th man you are saying the 10th man is still there we need not cry the guru says do not grieve yeah. it's a god exists brahman exists you that atman is there you are actually free right now there is no sorrow right now but we see sorrow we see suffering how is it that i am free of suffering right now i will show you yeah. this is paroksha gyana the, then comes the aparoksha gyana the direct the showing please count 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 thou art the tenth dashamastvam as in sanskrit thou art the tenth oh i am the tenth this is called aparoksha gyana direct knowledge when the guru shows and you practice it you notice the physical self the the i am not the body the vital uh, body i am not that the mental body i am not that the intellect body i am not that the blankness beyond the intellect the causal body i am not that and intuitively you grasp the consciousness grasp means you are i am that consciousness i am the awareness all of all of them all the problems of the body are in the body all the problems of the mind are in the mind all the ignorance and confusion in the intellect i am the witness of all of that i am free of ill health covid i am free of um uh, hunger and thirst i am free of um depression and frustration i am free of ignorance and confusion see the five sheets the problems associated with them i am the witness of them i'm not i'm not saying that they are not there those things are there in where they belong one uttarakhand sadhu put it very beautifully in uh, he said the solution in vedanta is to keep things in their own place ill health put it in its own place don't put it on yourself it doesn't belong to you it belongs to the body see no denial no escapism ill health is there in the body it has to be treated taken care of do yoga go to the doctor whatever has to be done but it's in the body it belongs to the body be care be clear about that put it where it belongs put things in their own place don't put things on yourself which don't belong belong there so this is the uh, aparoksha gyana the direct realization the difference between telling and showing i'm going i have a talk coming up later um, next week methodology of teaching in vedanta that's a unique methodology of teaching in vedanta not just a book not just a lecture not just a talk or a powerpoint or a chalk and uh, and blackboard but actually showing what did the teacher do 10th man that thou art he didn't just say there is the 10th man you are the 10th man and go away he showed what you are not and what you are so that is called aparoksha gyana direct realization that's the fifth stage the sixth stage is dukkha nivritti sorrow is gone they oh the tenth man has been found thank god they stop crying sorrow is gone i cannot die you know, poverty and ill health do not affect me things done and not done they say enlightened person characteristic interesting characteristic of enlightened person mentioned in the upanishad kritagrite natapati is not worried about what's been done and not done the to do list it tears up and throws away <laughs> nothing none of that is that you are always complete 
the doing and not doing things left undone and things which have been done neither of them can complete you or um, uh, diminish you in in the least so sorrow is gone there is no nothing to be so- sorry about even the past still uh, i mean now i realize i'm i'm all right but in the past so much suffering that suffering also was not necessary there is there is no reality to that like the suffering in a dream i was all right then too and because i am the underlying reality of the universe universe also everybody in the universe was all right is all right it is going to be all right it's perfectly all right then what happens seventh stage ananda prapti bliss joy fulfillment this very unlimited nature of the of the turi of the atman which is realized that is that is itself is joy there is nothing lacking anymore a sense of fulfillment comes and an unshakable such a secure sense of fulfillment it cannot be affected by anything in the world external or internal in the mind nothing can affect that fulfillment even in the worst of sorrows gita says na dukhe na guruna api vichalyate it cannot be affected so seven stages uh, agyana ignorance then error adhyasa and then uh, the sorrow samsara dukha then the indirect teaching the knowledge you get from teachers and books and then the direct realization aparoksha paroksha gyana aparoksha gyana then the dukkha nivritti sorrow is removed and then finally the ananda prapti of course dukkha nivritti ananda prapti they come immediately immediately after direct realization seven stages all illustrated by the story of the the 10th man such a wonderful story you see the whole of vedanta is, is packed into it the stages of spiritual life the methodology of you know, difference between telling and showing something and that skill in teaching and the direct the exact nature of enlightenment that turn in words those five i am not the five sheets three state three uh, states of waking dreaming deep sleep i am not the causal the subtle and the gross i am not i am the one to which whom they appear that turn intuitive turn it's all illustrated by this one story again try that uh, superimposition do the uh, superimposition your assignment what was the superimposition that the 10th man is dead and consequent sorrow what is the superimposition the 10th man is alive and showing that i am the 10th that same tying the donkey and untying the donkey you see the same thing is going on here not one bit different then the fourth story where the result of all uh, enlightenment is shown how is it that realizing i am the atman will solve all my problems all your desires are fulfilled by realization of brahman so ashnute sarvan kaman sah brahmana vipaschete ti taittiriya upanishad says the one who realizes brahman i am brahman all desires are fulfilled at once how all sorrow and lack is removed at once how just by knowing something how is that all desires fulfilled something we are running after crazily throughout our lives how can it be fulfilled all at once at one instant and forever so the story of the princess of kashi another golden oldie <laughs> <laughs> so in one ancient indian kingdom the uh, a theatrical performance was staged in the king's court and um the one of the characters was supposed to be the princess of kashi kashi is banaras the ancient spiritual city so the princess of kashi is a, is this play is not in kashi it's in some other kingdom and the um, princess of kashi is supposed to be a, a character in that play now the queen said who is going to play this princess of kashi is supposed to be a little girl who is going to play the little girl the queen said well the prince her son was 5 years old at that time you can dress him up as a girl he looks cute he look you put him and dress him up as a princess and he'll be the princess of kashi and that's how it was it happened and the and the play was staged successfully the prince looked so cute in the princess's uh, dress that uh, the queen said paint a photograph no i mean now this photo selfie or photograph but in those days you had to get the court painter and the uh, prince had to pose uh, in the dress and the painter painted him princess of kashi dated so and so big portrait was made 15 years passed the prince grew up and was doing all kinds of princely things riding and shooting arrows and learning and other things like that 
One day, while exploring the palace, he went down to an attic, uh, to, to a cellar, an old place where junk was kept. And he found this old painting. He wiped the dust of it and he saw the princess of Kashi and saw the date 15 years ago. Oh, she must be my age now. And he fell in love with her. I will marry this. She will be my queen. Without her, I will not be happy in this life. Now, he is too shy to tell his mother or his father, but he moped and he wouldn't pay attention to his studies or his training as the prince. And everybody noticed that the prince is not happy. But why? He wouldn't say. So one day, a wise old minister took him aside and said, Prince, what ails you? You can tell me. Confide in me. So I am in love. Oh, good. Who is she? She is the princess of Kashi. Oh, good. A princess. Even better. Where did you meet her? So I haven't met her. But I saw her picture. And it's an old picture. I mean, but she's my age. Clearly, the date shows she must be my age. The minister said, old picture, princess of Kashi. Can you take me to that picture? And the prince took him down into the cellar and showed him the picture. And the minister said, prince, you need to sit down. <laughs> Why? And he told him that this is not the princess of Kashi. Oh, whoever she is, I will marry her. No, wait. There was this theatrical performance 15 years ago. And the role of the princess of Kashi, um, your mother, the queen, she said to dress you up in the princess's dress. And we dressed you up and it was painted. And this is that painting that thou art, Tattva Masi. You are that. And of course, the princess, the, the problem was entirely solved immediately. But the question is, how was the problem solved? Did the prince marry the princess of Kashi? And then the, the, his desire was fulfilled? No. Did he find out that the princess of Kashi is dead or married to somebody else and so it cannot be fulfilled? You see, fulfillment of desire and frustration of desire. These are the two things that happen in the world. Neither of them are solutions. Then how was it fulfilled? He realized that there is no princess of Kashi apart from him. All along he himself was the princess of Kashi. This world is our princess of Kashi. Swami Vivekananda says, things are dead in themselves. We breathe life into them. Then we we'll run after them or run away from them. Not just attraction, fear also. Repulsion also, terror also. All of those things are like the princess of Kashi. It's not a thing apart from you. It is you dressed up in the form of temptation or terror. Temptation, I run towards it. It's a mirage apart from me. It's not, not nothing there apart from me. Terror. I run away from it. It's a mirage apart from it. There's nothing there that can harm me. Harm me, the consciousness. Once we realize that this whole universe becomes one with me, like the princess of Kashi became one with the prince, and realize that all the time, just because out of error, we thought outside. But actually, it is one and the same. I am that. There is none of that outside me, whether, no matter how tempting, no matter how scary. How attractive or how repulsive. It's all me. Everybody is I. Every object is I. Every event is I. I means the one consciousness, which is common to all of us. So this grand teaching, it solves the problem of desire. Once and for all. It shows the problem of desire to be a mirage. It shows that fulfillment is our, our eternally ours. We are eternally fulfilled. We project it outside ourselves. We identify with one body and mind and we say, now I need those, those, those things. I'm afraid of those, those, those things. And then samsara starts for us. Again, notice. Hypnotize, dehypnotize. Superimposition, desuperimposition. What was the superimposition? The prince thought, there is a princess of Kashi. I am in love with her and I have to marry her. Then only I will be happy. Superimposition. Samsara has started. This superimposition. Jagat Mithya, the world is an appearance. Appearance of what? Of you. You are appearing in a mirror as your own reflection. You are now scared of your reflection or attracted to your reflection. That reflection is nothing apart from you. That is the superimposition. Tying the donkey and untying the donkey. Just the illusion had to be cleared up. The problem had... The question this, uh, this is not to be solved, it's to be dissolved. 
what is the solution the solution is there is the princess of kashi and now we must give her a proposal and get married uh, get the prince married to the princess of kashi that's a solution or it's a fa- failure that maybe she's already married and she does there's no possibility of you marrying the princess of kashi that's solution successful or failure but that's not true that's still within the mirage the truth is there is no princess of kashi apart from you that is the untying the donkey same method अध्यारोपवादाभ्यापंचम प्रपंच्यते बाय द मेथड ऑफ सुपर इम्पोजिशन एंड डिसुपर इम्पोजिशन इज द ट्रांसेंडेंट डॉट फाइनल स्टोरी फिफ्थ स्टोरी दिस इज अ रियल गोल्डन ओल्डी बिकॉज द स्वामी विवेकानंद इज वन ऑफ हिज फेवरेट स्टोरीज एंड इट सम्स अप द होल ऑफ वेदांत वेरी नाइसली नाउ इट्स इट्स अ वेरी पॉपुलर स्टोरी इवन चिल्ड्रेन दे रीड अबाउट इट and it can be applied you don't have to apply just to advaita vedanta it's it's something that we can interpret in um, any context it's a very positive story so this lioness who was hunting a flock of sheep she jumped on the sheep and she was uh, heavy with young and she died and gave birth to a cub and the lion cub little cub its mother was dead and it was it's surrounded by sheep and the sheep took care of it and it slowly grew up thinking it was a sheep too and over time it bleated like the sheep it made sheep friends and it uh, ate grass and walked around in the herd of sheep till it grew to be this huge young lion but it still moved around with the sheep and ate grass now one day this big old lion was hunting and saw a flock of sheep as going to attack them and eat and then it saw in the middle of the sheep this huge young lion magnificent handsome young lion but bleating like the sheep and eating grass and was, the old lion was very puzzled what's going on here so he carefully stalked that uh, the flock of sheep and isolated the young lion and ran after it and the sheep ran bleating in fear and the young lion also lion ran bleating in fear till the old lion went up to it and caught pounced upon him and caught him and dragged him off away from the herd of sheep and said Why are you behaving like this? You are a lion just as as, as much as I am. And the young lion said, "Oh sir, please let me go. You are scaring me." He said, "But no, but you are a lion. Why are you bleating?" "No, I am not a lion. I am I am I am I am sheep. I am a sheep." "Well, you come with me." And he takes him and shows him in a pool of um water. "What I am that you are also. Look at my face and look at your face." At first, the young lion was scared and trembling, and he saw, "Oh, the same face, lion's face there, and my face is the same thing. I am a lion too. Now roar like me!" And he roared, and the young lion also roared, and realized his identity as a lion. Remember, he was a lion to begin with. What is the sheep? Material universe, the five elements. In the midst of the five elements, earth, water, fire, air. Uh, space this physical body and the vital body and the mind in sitting in the midst of that i the consciousness i also think i am like this i am this material uh, creature subject to all change and destruction and death limitation and sorrow and when con- when confronted by the universe i i get scared i'm so tiny i'm so helpless i'm so limited born just the other day and not going to be extinguished and then the guru comes the upanishad comes vedanta comes and says you are the lion of vedanta you are not a material creature vedanta kesari vedanta kesari means the lion of vedanta roar what is the roar aham brahmasmi i am brahman not that i have to become brahman i am a little creature now i have to become the infinite that's a big job no i am already that i have to awaken to my true nature sooner we do it the better for us so that was swami vivekananda's story of the lion the vedantic lion which is our true nature again notice the the tying of the donkey and untying of the donkey the lion which thought it was a sheep that's tying the donkey and it was taught that you are not the sheep you are a lion that's untying the donkey all throughout the donkey was free all throughout the lion was the lion all throughout the princess of kashi was one with the prince all throughout 
the tenth man was there. You yourself are the tenth man you are mourning for. All throughout, Janaka Raja was free of uh, the waking and the dreaming. He was the consciousness. But had to be shown. So these wonderful stories, they show us, they point to our real nature. Uh, that is the very methodology of Advaita Vedanta. So a storytelling session. Swami Vigyananda, I was reading, the disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. Um, he, this is a place where devotees are gathered around him. He was the president of the order at that time, in the 1930s. He says, Swami, tell us a story. And the Swami curtly says, a story? Who do you think I am? Your grandmother? <laughs> <laughs> but in, then he tells a wonderful story. And he says, this world is a story. Don't you, don't you see? It's a fairy tale. Once you see that, you will be happy. So, today I have done the grandmother role of <laughs> telling this grand old stories of Vedanta. God knows since when they have been passed down from teacher to student. I pray to the Lord, to Sri Ramakrishna, to the Holy Mother, to Swami Vivekananda to bless us with that Vedantic insight. To set free the donkey, untie the donkey. To set us free, to sh show us the glory within and the glory outside, everywhere, that one infinite being and consciousness and bliss. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Rupa Namastu